welcome everyone. I'm going to spotlight my video and officially welcome you all uh, to this evening's Indigenous program. Thank you all so much for joining us. My name is Celine Figueroa and I am with the Denver Museum of Nature and Science and I'll be your virtual host this evening. The Denver Museum of Nature and Science is pleased to partner with the in International Institute for Indigenous Resource Management for tonight's event in our ongoing monthly film series. As you're watching, to, or excuse me, as you're listening and watching and participating tonight, the way that we will be communicating um, is through the chat. So if you have any questions, thoughts, anything that you want to ask our amazing panelists, please put them in the chat. You might not be able to see each other's chats, but our team will be able to watch, um, watch for them and answer as many questions as we can. If you were not able to watch the film before tonight, don't worry, there is still time. You'll be able to stream the video with the link that I just posted in the chat and you'll put in the password that is in the chat as well. That video will be open for another 24 hours, a little more than that. So you'll be able to watch it later tonight or tomorrow before midnight. Without further ado, to begin tonight's event, I'd like to introduce Jean Rubin, who's the Director of Indigenous Film and Arts Festival. Jean, welcome. Thank you, Celine. Welcome to everybody to our uh, program tonight, From Earth to Sky. Tonight's program is part of the 18th Annual Indigenous Film and Arts Festival and also converges with our monthly Indigenous film series. So we have lots of folks to thank. Uh, our sponsors tonight are for the festival are um, the National Endowment for the Arts, Kanika Minolta and AARP. Those are the primary sponsors, but you saw the, uh, the slide scrolling on the screen as you logged in, you uh, saw logos from all of our sponsors, as well as our community partners. Uh, the community partners are folks who help with outreach, provide venues, uh, folks such as the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, uh, who is, has just done a wonderful job helping us transition from in-theater programming to these virtual events. So many thanks to the museum and to all our community partners. And two of the partners uh, that you saw are also the Indigenous Film Series sponsors. The presenting sponsor uh, for this entire year has been Mile High Behavioral Healthcare, and our media sponsor has been Kubo Jazz Radio. So a big thanks to everyone and a thanks to you folks uh, for joining us tonight. With me is Merv Tano. He is president of our institute. He's also a commissioner on the Denver American Indian Commission, which is one of the co-sponsors of the Indigenous Film Series. Merv will be moderating the conversation tonight with our two speakers, uh, Tammy Eaglebull and Daniel Glenn, two architects that you saw in the film. Uh, but before I turn the mic over to Merv uh, to start off with the questions, I would like to ask our speakers to uh, introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about um, how they came to be architects. So Dan, I see your mic is the one that's live. So why don't you kick it off? Show uh, Daje, I would like to start off by just introducing myself. Um, I, from my tribe, I, my uh, crow name is Akshia Ishuigia. Uh, that's in our language. It's uh, our tribe is the Apsalaga language, Apsalaga uh, tribe, not the Crow tribe. We're called the Crow, but um, our uh, our the name we call ourselves is Apsalaga. And uh, I'm very excited to be here today and be a part of this. I'm. Uh, uh, the principal of Seven Directions Architects Planners, and we are a native owned and operated firm based in Seattle, Washington. And we work primarily with tribal communities all over the region and across the country, uh, as well as nonprofits and other non-tribal clients. We really focus on doing culturally responsive architecture and environmentally responsive architecture. Um, and our goal is, is to create uh, a contemporary indigenous architecture that reflects and celebrates the cultures of the people that we serve. 
Um, and uh, I guess if you saw the film, you got a better sense of my background as well. And I'm happy to share more if you have questions uh, about it. Thank you. Tammy? Good evening. My name is Tammy Eagle. I'm a member of the Old Black Dakota Nation. Um, my family is from Pine Ridge, South Dakota. Um, I am the pres president of Encompass Architects. We are a nationwide architectural firm uh, headquartered in Lincoln, Nebraska, but now with an office in Tucson, Arizona. So we serve clients uh, in the Midwest and in the Southwest, uh, mostly tribal clients, but uh, we also do a, a fair amount of non-tribal work um, up in Nebraska. Um, I was inspired to become an architect uh, by my dad in, in, because he wanted to be an architect and his teaching and um, kind of explaining to me how uh, tribal architecture was working at the time when, when um, he was uh, with the Bureau of Indian Affairs um, had, did a lot to inspire me to establish a way to work with communities um, as opposed to working for them. And he was a big influence of, for me. And if you saw the film, you'll see that you know, he's in there. And he, it really means a lot to me that um, he was featured in the film because he passed away um, shortly after the film was made. So uh, it's a little bit of a, a um, bittersweet, I guess, to see him in the film. But thank you for being here. And thank you for inviting me. And Jean, I, I guess I neglected to answer your question regarding what inspired me to become an architect as well. And I have to say it's, it was heavily influenced by my father as well, who also sadly passed away just, just this year. In fact, he um, unfortunately never quite got to see the film um, uh, when it was completed. But uh, he was an engineer and ran a firm, uh, John Glenn Engineers Architects, uh, Constructors, um, and engineers in Montana, and we serve tribes all over the region. Uh, so I grew up doing this work. I started when I was 14 years old, drafting for my father. Uh, my first job was uh, updating maps of the reservations um, throughout the Northwest here. Um, but I really learned a lot in the process. Um, and I talk about my father as well in the film and his influence and my grandfather's influence, who was a tribal council leader. Um, his influence, I think, was stronger in terms of really compelling both myself and my father to serving our own tribal communities, which I think is really a, a big, a very important part of who most of us as Indigenous architects are. You know, we, we really see our work as more of almost a mission versus a job, uh, you know, to to really serve our our own communities, and and we come from communities with great need, and uh, whatever profession that we are uh, choose in our life, I think if we're a part of a, a tribe, a tribal community, we are compelled to use what we learn, what we the knowledge that we gain in a way that can really serve serve our communities. Thank you. Bert, you wanna start us off with some questions? Sure. Uh, Aloha, Tammy and Dan. Really happy to be with you, you all today. Uh, Dan and I have done this several times in several different venues. Uh, and this first time with uh, Tammy and uh, it's a pleasure to make your acquaintance. There is a, uh, there's a term uh, that's uh, used uh, quite a bit these days, uh, uh, decolonization. Uh, I don't particularly like that. Uh, I don't particularly like that term. Uh, uh, and we can go into that uh, at another time. I, I like the word uh, indigenization. Uh, when I look at y'all's work, and I see how you operate, I also, through the, uh, uh, the film, 
uh, have seen the results of of your work. But as someone who has in, been engaged uh, in, with uh, Indian tribes and other indigenous peoples for uh, just about my entire career, what impresses me about y'all's work is that the how of indigenous architecture is just as important as the what. Uh, the, the kind of early engagement with the different uh, tribal publics uh, you know, around form and function. Uh, I say, well, you know, if I'm a student, I have an idea of how I want a college uh, classroom to be like. Uh, uh, if, if I'm going to be uh, a resident in a uh, tribal housing project, I have a sense of how I want the uh, the kitchen and the bedrooms and the living rooms to all interact uh, with each other. But there's a, another aspect to the work. And uh, I think er early on, uh, uh, Tammy talked about that, uh, that, uh, you know, it, it doesn't matter if you're on Pine Ridge and you, you're building up a uh, building a new school, you can be a grandma with no uh, no kids there. That that school is still important to you as a a, a member of the Oglala Lakota Nation. Uh, it is important to you because it is part of your projects your identity. It projects your philosophy, your ideology, uh, your your sense of place. The, the question I have for you all is, how do you engage uh, uh, these uh, different uh, tribal publics around that kind of, uh, around those, uh, those functions of, of, a, of a building or of a project? So we can start with Tammy. Sure, sure. Um, you know, it's, I get asked this question a lot from um, other architects who are trying to start working in tribal um, communities, non-native architects, um, because they say, I go out there and I ask questions and no one answers me. You know, the whole room is just, and what do I say? What am I doing wrong? And, and you know, it, it, it's, it's kind of like that. It's something we can't really teach. You know, as architects, we're trained to talk about form and function and programming and, you know, space adjacencies and all that kind of stuff. And that's the easy stuff. It's taking the time to, um, you know, get to know people, establish trust, um, spend time with the community and listen. I think, you know, listening is the biggest part. And, and you know, what I'll tell people sometimes is, is listening to what, ha what, what they're not saying. Um, that means a lot also um, because of, you know, social dynamics and, and all that. Some people won't say anything in the meeting, but if you go into the kitchen, you know, you yeah, can strike right. up a conversation there, you know, and talk to the, you know, talk to the women in the kitchen or you go outside and sit with some of the, you know, the gentlemen and stuff. And so, you know, it's not as simple as just posing questions and, and hoping for answers and, you know, I always try to be very respectful, even with my own communities, you know, not going in there saying, okay, well, this is what we're about. This is what I know. Do you want me to use that in your, in your building? It's that those kind of discussions for, for um, my projects tend to come about more organically, you know, kind of on the sidelines, kind of, you know, around other things, um, over lunches, over dinners, you know, where people are more at ease and, and more willing to share as opposed to, um, you know, big groups where you're posing very sensitive questions that, um, you know, shouldn't, shouldn't probably be posed in that kind of situation. And that's what I always try to tell non-Native architects is, you know, don't go in and ask them to tell you all about their culture and ask them to tell you all their secrets and all their values and all that, you know, because you're, you're an outsider, you're, you're, you know, you don't have that trust. You have to spend the time there and, and, and build up that trust. Yeah, um, it's interesting that 
question about non-natives working with natives and you know how that works. I, I've experienced similar things. One of the things I've noticed is that when we do work with communities, we we spend a lot of time outside of the the conventional uh, process. You know, going to things like their ceremonies or their powwows, their events, their dinners, um, and it, just engaging that way. And for us, you know, it's often just necessary uh, part of the process of trying to understand who they are and what what they're doing. And and like we designed the Skokomish Community Center for the Skokomish tribe. And you know, we. we you know, one thing to be really clear about is, you know, even though we're from uh, tribal communities, we're not from their tribal community, you know. So uh, whenever we work in uh, any tribe, we we are still outsiders in that sense, you know, so we have to bring ourselves in. But we, because we work with tribes so often and because we grew up in tribal communities, we have a better sense, I think, of how to engage um, and, you know, like during the design of the Skokomish Community Center, we went, you know, we were invited to, to some of their uh, elders uh, feasts and uh, their first elk ceremony, you know, and we watched how they prepared food and we watched, you know, we, we, because we were designing, a, you know, a, a, a big community kitchen for them. We watched, you know, how they use space and, and, um, and all of the places that we were in were kind of makeshift because they didn't really have a, a big gathering hall or they were in their churches, you know, which created a separation because they were in specific denominations that weren't, you know, so they needed this gathering hall where they could all come together. But by going to these various places, seeing how they interact was just, you know, fundamental to doing the design. I think what's interesting is right now with the whole COVID thing, we've not been able to do that as much. It's been a challenge, you know, we, we've had, we've been pushed into the Zoom virtual space and it, it has been both, I think more difficult in some ways, it's been very uh, intimate because we're literally in people's homes, you know, like we are today, you know, or, you know, talking to them and uh, like we're doing a cultural center right now for my own tribe and over the last year and a half or something, we've been doing a series of meetings um, and they've gotten, you know, they're very long, you know, sometimes they're two or three hours uh, um, talking about issues around a culture. And it's a cultural center is at the heart of it. You know, it's, it's like really getting into the questions of culture and representation and what is a museum. And even the idea of a museum is counter in many, and, and, and kind of has a very negative connotation to many of our people. Um, and so it's like, how do we rethink that? But um, so it's taken many conversations. One thing I've also learned is that as Tammy is saying that, you know, a lot of the sidebar conversations are critical. And as even as a man, I recognize that I need, a, you know, women working with me uh, and they will engage differently with women, then I will be able to engage with women in these settings. And I'll often, you know, I, I prefer to go to these community meetings with, you know, uh, uh, Bobby Cook, who's a uh, Lakota architect in my office, or uh, Kimberly Dariana, who's not worked with us now, but she worked with us on many of our projects. And she's, uh, she's from the three affiliated tribes, you know, and, and all, you know, all these different projects, I always seem to be fortunate to have a, a, a woman as a partner in the process who's helping to kind of engage in that way. Um, and culturally, there's different ways that people interact, you know, with men and with women. And, and like Tammy is saying, in a big setting, a lot of times people won't speak up because, you know, there's all these also concerns about who has the right to speak or is given the right to speak. And um, and so it's, 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 it's a big it's an interesting and powerful part of the process. And as Tammy is also saying, it's an, it's an organic thing. I think one reason why non-natives have such a challenge with it is it's not a linear process. It's always, you always have to be ready to shift gears and go back to the beginning again and come back around, the, you know, 
uh, a lot of our like our engineers are just totally baffled. Like, wait a minute, you know, it's supposed to go from point A to point <laughs> B, and there is no uh, nothing like that in most of our work. Right. I, I I know there's been situations where you, you know you have a meeting with the, the tribal council chairman and he says yeah 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 that this is what we're going to do. Uh, then you get into tribal council meeting, and you, you can see <laughs> that that's not the sense of the body. Uh, and the first person that tells you you got this thing wrong <laughs> is the tribal chairman, <laughs> and you just got to suck it up and uh, understand that. That's the dynamic, you know? <laughs> yeah. And, and you know, one thing, Merv, I got to say, uh, it's not always the case in my experience that tribal clients are, are all about process. I mean, some of them are very worried about process, particularly the politicians, you know, and or sometimes like the housing authorities, they're, they're like, oh, you know, they won't even let us engage sometimes with the, the residents, they just say, well, we know, you know what folks, and we're the staff and all of this. And oftentimes uh, it's a push, like we have to really try to get them to let us, you know, uh, directly talk to the folks who are gonna live in, a, in the housing that we're designing or whatever. Uh, so I wouldn't say it's an, a given, you know, this process, right. we, we have to be uh, uh, proactive in making it happen. Um, and part of the reason I think people shy away from it is sometimes is it is difficult, you know, and they are worried about those circular efforts and it'll slow things down and people will have different opinions. And then, so, you know, it, it's, uh, uh, it's, it, I, what I guess what I would say is that it's different on every project, <laughs> you know, the process, it's never like we, we keep thinking like, oh, if we could just sort of set up this, this thing we always do, it doesn't work because we have to design the process for every project in every community because it's always so different. Thank you. Have uh, anything else you'd like to uh, add, uh, Tammy? Yeah, yeah, I think it's this, this, when Daniel talks about, you know, having to Somehow, sometimes having resistance from, from our tribal clients to opening up the discussions to a wider community. Um, it, it, that to me is, is um, one of the things that we often have to talk about in this idea of how tribes can now start to express our sovereignty through the built environment. How it's been something that's kind of been, you know, pushed, you know, not really thought about because we've been, just been surviving and our built environment has largely been a result of funding efforts or you know someone coming in some agency coming in and putting a building down or you know an outside um, agency coming in and you know designing it over here and bringing it and plopping it down and really hasn't been a lot of um, interaction with the communities and um, working with our clients and talking to them a lot about how you know our sovereignty also should extend to how our communities look and how our built environment looks. And the only way we're going to really get to that is involving the whole community. Um, it, yes, it may slow down the design, you know, the, the decision making process a little bit, but in the end, what you have is a greater sense of consensus. So people have um, the feeling that this building is theirs. They have an ownership in the building. They have you know, they know that they were involved. Their idea might not have been listened to, but they know that they were involved and that someone heard what they said and they, they had that opportunity. And so, you know, we really try to, um, you know, tell clients that, tell our tribal clients and work with them and, and, and explain that, you know, what we're trying to do in terms of, you know, making these buildings is not just, purely for architecture's sake. It's not just, you know, designing something to design something. Um, uh, the past has, has um, shown them that they can get something really fast, you know, a pole barn or something done really fast. And it doesn't, you know, that's why our communities look the way they do now with temporary buildings, with modulars, with, you know, metal structures, because people tell them that this, this is fast, we can make the best use of your money. and you don't have to worry about it. And so this ideal of, of function over everything 
um, has been a survival technique in our communities. And, you know, I think one of our roles as Indigenous architects is to, you know, kind of slow that down a little bit and say, okay, that's great. You know, we, we understand money is hard to come by. You know, getting a new building is a, often, you know, definitely a new school is a once in a lifetime thing for these communities. So yeah. let's do it in a way that you guys participate. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. I, I, uh, I completely agree with what you're saying, Tammy, for sure. Yeah, it's, that is a very important point that uh, it's a relatively new thing for our clients to even have the opportunity to have a say in what's being built, you know, mm -hmm. in the seventies and eighties growing up doing this stuff with my father. I mean, it was just handed down directly by the Bureau of Indian Affairs or HUD, you know, they had no say in what was going to be built. And also even now, a lot of people don't, you know, when we start talking about like culture and stuff, they think, you know, well, that's what you do maybe in a cultural center, but you don't necessarily think that's something you can or do. Or a casino. Yeah, yeah. But not something you can do in like a house where we live, you know, which yeah. is so, because they just think, well, that's, we haven't lived in our uh, homes that represent our culture for usually for more than a century, you know, the, the houses we've been put in are not anything to do with our culture. So it's, it's like we've, our community has learned to adapt them, you know, the house, like the, like the way I think about it is like, you know, the buff, you know, the baseball cap is, has nothing to do with our people, but, you know, we've adapted that and you'll see, you know, beadwork and, and it's been transformed by us to make it, you know, native, you know, but it's not ours. That's what people have been doing with housing forever. They, you know, they, the way they treat the inside space and how they make it their own and uh, but it's not the the shape the place the 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 physical form has nothing to do with the culture um i just noticed we have a nice question here from the audience it says they'd love to hear how the panelists are working with the next generation of architects from emma mcneely um i think that's a really important question um you know the way I do it and I I'm, I'm not sure I'd love to hear how Tammy does it but a part of how I do it is I, you know I see our role as being mentors to the next generation you know and, and hiring as much as possible when we can uh indigenous people who are in the you know striving to be architects and um I think it's it's a very important part of what we do, but then also in uh, engaging as practitioners in the educational environment as well. You know, I, I try to do that as much as I can, you know, in terms of uh, teaching and getting involved with universities where indigenous students have a chance to uh, learn, um, but also in terms of, uh, you know, encouraging people to to consider this as a as a possible profession uh um you know so i i think that uh that one thing from the film i think it's really compelling and it, it talks about like that with wanda you know and her student you know and seeing that next generation coming around um and her as an educator you know uh i think it's really critical and i think it's critical that we have more people like wanda and more you know in indigenous educators in the schools of architecture and in planning it's very exciting that we recently you know the unm just hired uh, the first native uh, uh, um, architectural director i think the first probably in the united states uh, for the School of Architecture, who's one of our colleagues. So it's pretty, you know, it's changing, but um, it's hard. And for Tammy and I, we didn't have that, you know, when we were students of architecture, we had Douglas Cardinal, that was about it, you know, to look up to. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he's still someone to look up to, but, you know, we didn't have uh, professors, we didn't have um, even practitioners really to look to, to see doing this work and doing it in a distinct way. Um, 
so I, I, I think it's a big part of what we need to do. Yeah, it's, it's so exciting because there are so many young um, architects coming up who are in school now and you know all over the country. I do a lot of lecturing at different universities and it's, it's uh, really makes me really happy that there are so many out there. And so, you know, along with all the things that Daniel said, I think one of the, the main things I try to do when I'm out with a community out on a tribal community is, is be seen and be out there and talk to the, the, you know, school kids, kids who are, you know, as young as kindergarten and just talk to them about, you know, you can be an architect. This is what an architect does. And this is, you know, how you can come back and help your community. Cause you know, when I was growing up, I, I grew up in a community off the reservation, even though both my parents are on the reservation, they wanted us to be able to, um, you know, live in two worlds and, and, and be able to um, succeed in both worlds. So, um, you know, I didn't have a lot of um, knowledge about uh, Native architects at all. My dad had some interaction with them through his, his job with the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and he was actually the one who told me you know, these buildings are just showing up and people don't have any ownership in them. Um, you know, that needs to change. And I think you know, being seen and, and being, and letting these you know, school age children know that this is a way that you can come back and help your community. It took me a long time to figure that out. I thought the only way I could come back and help my community was through medicine or law or social work. And you know, I wasn't interested in any of those. And it was my dad who, you know, through his continuing and you know, going back home and seeing the dichotomy between you know, what my cousins had and you know, the schools that I went to and you know, all these just you know, different uh, worlds, I was able to kind of piece it together that, yeah, this is something I could come back and do. And this is a way that I could help my community. And so I think that's, that's um, one of the, the the key things that I try to do with our with the, the next generation and the next 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 generation is try to just be be available and, and be seen so that they know it's a possibility. Yeah, what I appreciate about y'all's uh, work uh, and is that to me it kind of uh, <clears throat> encapsulates the. Uh, the uh, the interest I have uh, around uh, architecture because I I, I I I think of panels such as this uh, as supporting our our issue or our our interest in nation building so it's the architect, the designer, as nation builder, and it's which which is why I think the how is is so important uh, in in the work because I I, I know that the, the the city leaders in in, in Denver are very proud of uh, the, the Denver Art Museum, the, the, the Leafskin building. I have no real attachment to that building. I was not involved at all in that, in that building. Uh, the idea that they should uh, somehow consult with me uh, uh, never occurred to anyone. But they're not concerned about nation building. They just want an edifice that says, you know, we're with it. We got the cool guy. We got a cool building. And, you know, we, we can plaster on any kind of narrative we want about that building. And it's, it's good to go. No one is going to challenge that. Whereas when, when you're, if, if, if you're on the res, well, the, the interest is a lot more, I think the word was you is more intimate. It's more personal. It is about us. It is about my kids. Uh, it is what this building says about me, my family, uh, and, and, this, and these people, these peoples, this nation. 
So it's a, is there a kind of an explicit uh, course as you go about uh, at conferences and, uh, and, 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 and lecturing at universities that, that says, okay, you all are architects, you are engineers, you're designers, but you're also nation builders. Well, I think the, the key thing here is that, and, and we're actually writing about this in our next installment of Our Voices, you know, that we, we have this series of, of books out and the third one is coming up and I'm, I'm co-authoring a, a chapter with Bobby Cook in my office uh, of, with two generations writing about the education of the indigenous architect. Because, you know, to become an indigenous architect is a conscious process in my view, you know, that because we're all educated in, in conventional Western education systems, you know, that don't, that don't talk about these kinds of things, you know, um, we have, we, I personally had to sort of uh, rethink, you know, my own education and, and find other ways of figuring out how to do what I do, you know, outside of the box that I was in, in the conventional school of architecture at Montana State University at the time. Um, in fact, I left for my, my thesis, I went to Nicaragua and did a, my, my, my thesis project um, with a community, you know, of, of, of campesinos in the middle of, you know, rural Nicaragua, um, completely outside my university, and and uh, was studying people like Hassan Fathi, who was an Egyptian architect who wrote Architecture for the Poor, and worked directly with uh, the community that uh, some of the communities he worked with to develop a, a different approach. Because I found the way architecture was being taught and still is in many respects as a very elitist yeah. exercise geared, like you're saying, towards a commodified built environment that, you know, uh, the, the idea of a Leapskin building or a, uh, you know, a Frank Gehry building, these are, these are, these are um, uh, designer label buildings you know, and the designer label is going to be the same if Frank Gehry's doing the building in LA or if he's doing it in Barcelona, you know, it's Frank Gehry, it's not Barcelona or LA, it's Frank Gehry, you know, and <laughs> not to say I don't enjoy his buildings, but I'm saying it's, it's that idea is completely counter to creating buildings that are for the people that we, you know, are designing with and for, exactly. you know, it's, it's the opposite, really. And sadly, schools of architecture tend to put, still, you know, uh, advocate that idea of the, you know, the, the designer architect. And that's what students, you know, dream of becoming, having that signature that it says, this is me, 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 versus this is, you know. It's supposed to be you, we, we, we. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I mean. I, I want to create buildings and I've sought to create buildings that when my clients look at it, they see themselves, they don't see me. Yeah. That's fundamental to what we need to be doing as architects, I believe. And that isn't to say that we are not artists and we don't have a compelling vision ourselves. I think right. that's where people get lost. They think that, oh, that sounds boring. It's like, oh, you're just going to, you know, do whatever uh, you're told to do. But the thing that we need to recognize is that our clients are not architects. They, they don't have the, the, you know, the, the toolkit to create the vision. We have that toolkit, but they have the vision. So we have to like find that within the, the project. The other thing that's so powerful about indigenous architecture is I find it almost comical how, uh, you know, how so many architects seek meaning in a project. Uh, like we went through that whole stage of like literary references and, you know, all these, you know, concepts of like deconstructivism or whatever, all <laughs> built around like 
trying to find meaning in architecture. We don't have to look for meaning. We don't have to read a book and find it. The meaning is so powerful within each of the cultures that we work with that, you know, it's just a matter of like trying to figure out how to take that meaning and turn it into a built form, you know, which is a wonderful challenge. But, we, you know, the metaphors, the, the symbols, all of that is there, you know, it's just there for the taking. And so in that way, it's it's much easier and more powerful uh, to work in the world that we work in. Yeah, and I, I, I would just add that I think you know, both the architectural education system and then just as architects, we tend to like to pat ourselves on the back a lot. You know, our, you know, the AIA is it's all about winning awards. If you look on any architecture firm's website, it's has won this many awards, this many awards, this many awards. And, you know, the architecture becomes so much about um, ego versus, you know, in a lot of our cultures, we're taught to, you know, not have that ego. You're, you're taught to do the best for the community. And I think that's what, um, you know, as indigenous architects, that's what we try to do and put our ego aside. And, you know, when, when, when I was first starting my firm, like 20 years ago now, I did kind of a little tour around um, a, a bunch of reservations in, in the Midwest and talked to people and asked, you know, what's been your experience? Uh, you know, I see you have this new school or I see you have this new building. What was your experience on that? And, you know, I didn't ask names. I didn't ask for any names of architects, but I said, you know, how did that go? And how, you know, what, what did you like? What did you didn't like? And overwhelmingly what I heard was, um, you know, it's a beautiful building, but, we, you know, they didn't do what we wanted, um, or they they came out and we could tell right away that they just wanted to win an award because they were asking about you know legends and stuff. And so that's the perception of architects that we we show up out there and we want to do beautiful things because we want to win awards. And you know that's that's a perception that I think the architecture profession has to battle if they want to. And then go over in, in into this world into tribal communities and um, because that oh, you know, I think no, makes okay. tribal people. Oh, am I? Can you hear me now? Yeah. 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 For a minute. Uh, okay. Sorry. I was gonna say that's just one thing that makes tribal people a little less um, forthcoming with with you know some of the, the culture questions, the values questions, because they're wondering how it's gonna be used. And is it gonna be exploited into an award yes. that's gonna show up on our page? Yeah, you know, we, we win awards on occasion, but we rarely go after like AIA awards and stuff. And it was funny this year, we decided, okay, we're gonna submit the still a uh, Guamish village, which is like this whole village that we designed in uh, for a tribe along the Stillaguamish River. And it was the first, you're talking about decolonization or, you know, indigenization. It was the first, you know, Stillaguamish village, a contemporary village in 150 years along that river. Uh, and, you know, I, I think the architecture is pretty compelling as well. Uh, the irony was that we didn't win anything with the project and the winning project was actually the renovation of, of Fort Warden, a Fort Warden building. Uh, they did a you know, kind of nice re rehab of an old fort building. Um, and it is being turned over to community use. But, but the irony is that, that that fort was literally where the people were based that, that you know, colonized the entire region. <laughs> <laughs> and so our decolonization project won nothing but the, uh, you know, the <laughs> I just found it so ironic that it was, it's almost... And, you know, and another big winner was like, you know, some multi-million dollar house overlooking the, you know, the sound. And it's just like, come on, you know, um, the idea of the awards, as you're saying, is like, what are we awarding? You know, what is it about, you know, how do we look to, to think about um, creating awards that really honor projects that truly serve their communities and truly reflect their communities versus like, you know, what we're saying, what looks good in a magazine cover or, you know, uh, 
what what excites the the elite of the architectural profession which often if anything doesn't even relate at all to the to the to the non-architect uh, you know we have another question here um yeah, so I actually came very close myself to, you know, when I was young to like abandoning being an architect because uh, when I was in school, I just got the impression that, that the the role of the architect is to serve the 1%, you know, to serve the rich and the elite and to create buildings that that do, do that. And it, 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 it really took a while for me to figure out ways that we can, that I can work in, you know, in a different realm um, and really do things, you know, things like affordable housing, community facilities, educational structures, things that really serve the community. Oh, Dan, can, uh, we need to, uh, I'd like to, I'd like to read the question so folks uh, have the context. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Um, someone is, you know, th thanking our speakers for their perspectives. Um, I couldn't agree more that the conventional architecture industry is all about the self and championing ego. I couldn't agree more about the AIA. I used to be an architect but left the profession because there was no consideration for underserved communities. I only wish more architects could hear this talk. And actually they can because it's being recorded <laughs> <laughs> and it will be posted. And uh, if you know architects who need to hear these, these uh, Words of wisdom, share the link. Well, you know, the other thing too is, you know, what is an award? It is really ourselves. It's, it, you know, most of our awards, we're giving ourselves awards, you know, for what we, it's, it's, a, it's a patting ourselves on the back as Tammy's saying. <clears throat> and for, for us, for me, what, there's no greater award than going to a, you know, to a community gathering in a space that I, you know, designed and seeing it being used and seeing it being loved or seeing people take photos of themselves in front of the building because they feel it reflects their culture and heritage and they're proud of it. You know, to me that there's nothing more powerful. I'd say the, the biggest reward I ever got was when the Skomish Community Center was built, there was an elder who was talking about the project and he, he, he said he was, you know, at the opening, he said, when, when our people come into this space, they take a deep breath, they go like this, like they're breathing in, they're looking around and they're feeling the awe of the space. And he said, and when they, when we do that, we're breathing in the strength of our ancestors because our ancestors are here with us. I mean, who could ask for a more powerful, oh, you know, uh, recognition of the work that we're trying to do than that. To me, that's that's everything. I want to weigh in on this, this whole concept of awards because when we started the festival, we made the conscious decision not to have awards because we didn't want to have an atmosphere where the the filmmakers were competing with each other, you know, for who's the best this or the best that, you know, the, the audience choice and the best doc and the best narrative. And, and whatnot. We had a grad student um, do a little write up about our festival <laughs> early on. And his conclusion was we weren't going to make it as a film festival because we had no red carpet and we had no awards. <laughs> so 18 years later, I don't know how many times he's reread his chapter on our festival, but any day now, I guess we're going to go out of business. <laughs> uh, I would like to say also, though, um, one of my favorite um, festivals was the, um, the festival that was uh, put on by the National Museum of the American Indian, and it was a biannual event, and they also did not have awards, and that was one of the things I particularly liked about them. And I wanted to make a point of saying that because I see Elizabeth Weatherford, who directed that festival, um, is, is in the Zoom audience tonight, so um, that was my... Uh, validation that we had made the right decision. Yeah, I agree. We, we made a decision when we started the company too, after after I made that little tour, 
not to go after awards either. Um, just because we didn't want our clients to, to you know, misunderstand our intentions. We wanted them to know that we were uh -huh. there. For yeah, the only, the only thing I'll say about that is that when the awards can have values, when they can bring recognition to the work in some way, like we, the Puyallup Place of Hidden Waters was selected as the project of the year by, for the uh, lead for homes. It was a lead for homes platinum project. And it, it was an affordable housing project on a reservation, you know, which, and it won the, the, you know, project of the year in the whole country. To me, that's, that's a victory for that client, you know, and for our, uh, and demonstrating that, you know, in, uh, housing on reservations has, can be done in a way that, you know, has that level of, of uh, value. And, um, and, so I think that there is a place for that uh, because I guess, Tammy, what I, what I, what I think is it is important that uh, the profession start to recognize this kind of work and see it for, you know, see the value of it. I think that, you know, like when um, that uh, Joy Molnar wrote new, new architecture on indigenous lands, it was really the first book to see the work that we are doing as worthy of, you know, uh, of being recognized as a, as a new genre of architecture that, that's compelling just as architecture, you know, not, you know, and, and it upsets me to be honest, when our books are put, you know, in the native section only <laughs> right. bookstores, it's right. like not even in the architecture section. <laughs> it's like, oh yeah, yeah, that's, that's, the Indian stuff over there. <laughs> so I, well, I guess what I'm saying is, I think it's important that we do uh, yes. um, push the profession itself into recognizing what we do is valuable. Yeah, I agree. I think any kind of publicity that we can um, bring to what we do is good uh, really in terms of value. Um, but I'm just very leery of enticing more people to come into this world and, you know, with, with uh, different intentions, I guess, mm -hmm. than, than what we're established here. Um, you know, creating, I've been talking to various people at the AIA about, you know, can we just even add a, a, a score on the awards of client satisfaction? Yeah, you know? exactly. Yeah. Because honestly, it probably take out a lot of the you know, non-native done projects on Indian country because, you know, a lot of them aren't very happy with that. But I will say, you know, like one of the, um, the, the rewards that I get from this is uh, when we were filming the, the, the movie and we were out at uh, Pahesente Oawaya in Porcupine, the school and the film crew was talking to a lot of the children when they were using the drone and filming around. They said the children who were there were telling them about the school, like telling them some of the design concepts and telling them, oh, this, you know, this represents this and this means this. And the really interesting part is those children weren't even born a lot of times before when we were designing the school. So this idea of working with the children and the design concepts of the school have been handed down and have become part of the, the memory of that school. And so, you know, children who were involved or knew all about it and were just as proud of it um, as the, the, the kids we worked with. And then also that same year, I was giving a, a lecture in uh, Omaha and there was a young man there and I was talking about the school and he raised his hand. He said, I was one of those kids that you worked with. And that's why I'm here trying to learn about architects and being an architect. You know, so that's the stuff wow. that I do. This well, and that's you the know, reward. Yeah, absolutely. And, and when you talk about user satisfaction, like the building that's pictured behind me here, the Payne Family Native American Center at the University of Montana, it won the, the uh, uh, best architecture award by the by as voted by the students of the campus you know they were asked to you know name their favorite building and they named this one which is i think really important 
because it was all the students, not just the native students, it's the Native American Center, but the whole campus appreciates the building uh, and loves to come in the space and utilize the space. And, and that was part of the goal of the project was to, to um, not only to, you know, uh, get, create a, a significant building in the heart of a campus in Montana that strongly recognize native people on native land, but also, you know, to, to teach people about the culture and the beauty and the power of it in a place that has often, you know, myself growing up in a, in a state with seven reservations and almost no recognition architecturally anywhere in the state. This building was one of the very first non-reservation buildings to even symbolize or celebrate native culture in the state of Montana. Um, so, you know, I think that, that, that that's also important that what we do is, you know, that idea of decolonization or indigenization is bring recognition to in, indigenous people in places that, you know, have, we've been completely ignored or forgotten, even though we're literally on, you know, all on indigenous land. Yeah, because you see, that point I, I think is, uh, is a very important one to, to make, Daniel, because for me, it's about the kind of projection of, of soft power, you know, extraterritorially. It's, you, say, you don't have to just have sovereignty within, within the res or on the res. It makes real, it reifies this notion that we're all on, on native lands. Uh, and it, 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 it's a way of saying, and not so much of putting a stamp of ownership, but saying, yeah, this is our place. We have standing to be here. We have standing to kind of uh, uh, create a, 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 an environment that reflects the history of our history on this place as well. Yeah, but before this center was built, the native center was housed in a in a 1920s bungalow down the street, you know, from the campus. Uh, that was the place where all native activity occurred. Uh, and to be able to take go from that, you know, to this dramatic, significant building right in the heart of the campus, there's a, a historic oval. As the president at the time, uh, George Dennison said, it, you know, uh, it's a seat at the table, you know, for the indigenous people right here in the campus. And I think that we need a seat at the table. We need a seat at the table in every city, like you're saying, not just on the reservation, but you look at the city of Seattle. We had a big uh, uh, debate of several years ago about a new new building at the here at the uh, Seattle Center, which is in the heart of the building of uh, the, the city. And we wanted it to be a native building, uh, you know, to represent indigenous people. And it ended up being a Chihuly glass museum. <laughs> That's what it ended up being. So it's, a, it's kind of perfect irony because it's the celebration of the individual, you know, and the marketing of, of, the, of the city through that individual versus, you know, celebrating the, the original inhabitants of this place. <laughs> I was like, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of crazy, but that's what ended up happening. And so even in the city of Seattle named for, you know, Chief Seattle, we don't have any significant indigenous building in the city of Seattle uh, to speak of. So um, I think that we need to see that. We need to start transforming our urban environments to, uh, to celebrate and reflect the original inhabitants uh, of, of these lands. Okay. Uh, how much time do we have? Uh, so Celine, I just jumped in. Um, we, I love the conversation that's happening. So if our audience is willing to stay an extra 10 minutes, we have got about 10 more minutes left of the program. Um, so we can keep the, this amazing discussion going. Okay. okay, thank you. Because I wanted to reflect on uh, and, and uh, on, on what you just said, uh, Dan, 
and, and, and have uh, uh, Tammy and you kind of uh, uh, close it out. Because for, for me, the, uh, as, a, as, as a non-architect, uh, I, I see the kind of uh, uh, indigenizing of uh, places like Seattle, places like Denver, occurring at, a, at, at, at at least two levels. One is in the in that built environment, okay, so that there is a a structure that uh, uh, that reflects the uh, the presence of the history of uh, the uh, the native peoples of let, let's say Denver. But I think just as important is, is the how. So to the extent that we can inculcate in the practice of architecture, the kind of uh, uh, transparency, the kind of non-hierarchical uh, 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 participation with the community, uh, that's just as important from from my perspective, as having uh, a building. So if uh, we could get Tammy to uh, kind of react to that, uh, and then Dan, and then we'll close up. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I agree. I think, um, you know, taking this, the idea of indigenization of architecture, indigenization of the community, the built environment um, beyond the reservation borders is definitely the next step. And, and you know, I think, you know, if you think about this whole kind of, I don't know, it's not really a movement, but it, I guess it, you know, it started with with um, Douglas Cardinal, and and you know, now we're starting to gain some momentum through, um, you know, work that you know Daniel and my other colleagues and I are doing, and getting some notoriety and getting some interest in this type of um, architecture. That coupled with the um, amount of students in architecture schools, in planning schools, in um, engineering. I think that's all gonna, you know, just keep going as a snowball and and start to address these things that, you know, even like like up in Canada, even though they're, I think in Canada they have like 15 indigenous architects, but they are gaining great strides in terms of getting buildings in um, big cities that are that are representing their the um, the First Nations communities there. You know, Danny and I have both been to New Zealand and, and have met with our Maori counterparts over there. And, and I was blown away over there about how how integrated the, the culture and accepted the culture is by non-Maori people. And, and, you know, in America here, we have a long way to go um, just because of, you know, the, the history of colonization and, you know, all the other crazy things that are happening that there is a hesitancy to recognize and value things that are different, people that are different. And, um, but I agree, I think that would be, that's the ultimate goal is to, is to show that as cultures, we did inhabit this entire land and, and, and it should reflect in the environment in some way. Well, I think Tammy, what you brought up about the Maori that we learned when we went there is that not only are they looking at the um, symbolic power of new structures in the cities that reflect the culture and everything, but they're also looking at, you know, influencing the design of the city itself yes. and applying Maori principles to, you know, Auckland and you know in a in a significant way so and making sure that there are Maori voices at the table on every major new decision about what's going to be built in that place the people so that the people of that original people of that place uh, are still having a voice about what gets built and and the the it's it's a benefit beyond you know symbolism because those principles are also about living in a more symbiotic way with the planet which i think ultimately that's really what's fundamental here is that the culture that we are that's replaced us in a sense the one that is now dominant for the last several hundred years on this continent and elsewhere 
is destroying the planet, the culture itself, the Western civilization experiment is a <laughs> is a very dangerous one. And we are now seeing what's happening. You know, it's it's leading to uh, uh, this extraordinary catastrophe environmentally. So uh, learning from the people who managed to inhabit this land for thousands of years, you know, versus a couple hundred years is just good sense. You know, <laughs> it's like, well, how did that work? What can we do differently? And, and it's not just about, you know, it's not about uh, technology. It's about a, a philosophy. It's a, it's a yeah. way of looking at the earth, not as a commodity to be exploited, but as, as a part of the family. You know, it, it literally, you know, we look, in, indigenous people look at, 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 at Mother Earth in a, in a very literal way. We are the children of, of Mother Earth. And, and, and the, uh, the plants and the animals and all these are our sisters and our brothers that we need to take care of and, 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 you know, and not treat as, you know, something to exploit as we wouldn't exploit our own brothers or sisters. So, you know, I think that that philosophy is fundamental in terms of, of how do we rethink and reshape our urban environments um, and our rural environments as well as we move forward. So I, I think that's the bigger, hopefully the bigger message of the film, you know, and I think Douglas Cardinal certainly said it better than I'm trying to express it in the film. I think he says it powerfully, you know, that, that uh, we need to listen to our elders and we need to learn from our elders if we're going to survive. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I had a great time. Thanks. <laughs> well, thank, thank you, Jean and Merv and, and Tammy. It's great to see you again. And Merv uh, and, and Jean, I really appreciate all your efforts to bring uh, this film festival annually. And Celine, I, I appreciate your hosting this. So thank you, everybody. Thanks. Uh, yeah, thank you for inviting me. Thanks. Thank you, uh, both our speakers, for, for taking the time to, to share your thoughts with us. Really appreciate that. Thanks to our audience for joining us. Um, and thanks always to DMNS for providing this platform Absolutely. and being such a great partner in all of these film programs. So I will turn it over to Celine. She's going to usher us out. <laughs> Absolutely. And inevitably, every time that I start to usher out, there's a question in the chat that I think everybody should um, get the answer to. And if you all would like to stream the film again, or for the first time, I'm going to relink that in the chat. Um, I've also included the link to the donation bucket in the before times, which sounds like this eerie, eerie thing. We literally had a bucket um, when we, we streamed the films and people were kind and generous enough to, to donate to it, to make sure that these can continue going. I put the link in the chat um, in there as well. And if you enjoyed this conversation, if you enjoyed the film, if you recognize the importance of these stories and the platform for these stories to continue being told. We really encourage you to donate for, to the International Institute of Resource Management. Thank you all for a wonderful program tonight. We will see you uh, next year. Yeah. Yes. Thank you all. Thanks so Good much. Night. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Good night.